In this video, we're going to take a look at the developments that took place in Season 7, Episode 15 of The Curse of Oak Island. But before we do, we'd like to ask that if you haven't done so already, you please consider getting yourself a copy of my book, The Oak Island Encyclopedia, which you can find by clicking the link in the description. In light of Gary Drayton's discovery of an iron bracket in the swamp in the previous episode, members of the Oak Island team returned their attention towards the so-called Ship Anomaly at the beginning of Season 7, Episode 15, hoping once again that this feature might be the site of a buried ship. The narrator reveals that the depth of the Ship Anomaly is not uniform, with the northern end lying at a depth of 15 feet and the southern end lying at a depth of 55 feet. Accordingly, the crew decides to dig a 15-foot deep exploratory trench at the anomaly's northern end. Several feet below the surface, the treasure hunters discover an axe-cut wooden stake similar to those discovered nearby in Season 7, Episode 11. Unfortunately, Billy Gerhardt, who was tasked with carrying out the excavation, is precluded from digging his trench to the planned depth of 15 feet due to the hardness of the clay that lies beneath the organic material. Fearful that they might damage their backhoe if they persist, the crew decides to terminate the operation. While Billy Gerhardt was in the process of digging the trench, Gary Drayton conducted a metal detecting operation in the surrounding area. He quickly came across a metallic object buried beside a cone-shaped rock. This artifact proves to be a pointy metal cone in which a wooden dowel is embedded, held in place by two rivets. Initially, says Rick Lagina in a later interview, it looked like a spear point or a lance point, rather. But then we turn it about, and it appears hollow. Later in the episode, Marty Lagina, Alex Lagina, and Gary Drayton have the artifact examined by Carmen Legg, who identifies it as the tip of a pike pole, a tool used to maneuver large wooden objects, and dates it from 1710 to 1790, similar to the bracket he analyzed in the previous episode. He further opined that the object was used to, quote, maneuver ships in really, really close spaces, unquote, bolstering the theory that the remains of a ship, burned or otherwise, lie interred within the Oak Island swamp. In the middle of the episode, the Oak Island crew members meet in the war room with author James McQuiston, who presented his Oak Island theory back in Season 6, Episode 20. In his previous War Room meeting, McQuiston had put forth the theory that members of the Knights Baronets of Nova Scotia, a 17th century Scottish chivalric order associated with the short-lived Scottish colony of Nova Scotia, had buried the treasure of the Knights Templar on Oak Island sometime in the 1630s. I will explain the story of the Knights Baronet in greater detail later on in this video. In this episode, McQuiston expands on his theory by claiming that Sir William Alexander, the founder of the aforementioned Nova Scotian colony, was the leader of a secret proto-Masonic fraternity. The bottom line, he summarizes, is that it's more than apparent that the Scottish clan leaders who became the Knights Baronets of Nova Scotia had lots of links to the Freemasons, unquote. Freemasonic symbolism having been associated with a number of Oak Island discoveries made over the past two centuries. McQuiston goes on to suggest that Daniel McGuinness, Anthony Vaughan, and especially John Smith, the co-discoverers of the Money Pit, may have been aware of the existence of the Oak Island treasure due to their descent from members of the Knights Baronet, and may have deliberately searched for the Money Pit in 1795. After their meeting in the War Room, Marty Lagina, Charles Barkhouse, Laird Niven, Steve Guptill, and Peter Fornetti head to the foundation of the McGuinness family home on Oak Island's Lot 21. The narrator informs us that the team has acquired a permit to excavate the anomalies surrounding the foundation, the subterranean features having been discovered by GPR experts Steve Watson and Don Johnston back in Season 7, Episode 5. Under Niven's direction, the treasure hunters use pins and string to mark off the locations of the test pits they plan to dig, and begin to excavate these areas with trowels. Each load of spoils is filtered on a sifting screen, and minutely scrutinized. Under Laird's supervision, Rick Lagina explains in a later interview, we will conduct a proper archaeological dig of the foundation and the surrounding area." Unquote. Near the end of the episode, the treasure hunters resume the excavation of the trench in the uplands area between Smith's Cove and the Money Pit area, in which several large timbers were discovered in the previous episode. In this episode, they uncover more timbers, as well as several large wads of what are later determined to be coconut fiber, a material said to have been found in large quantities on Smith's Cove by the Truro Syndicate in 1850, comprising a layer of what appeared to be a massive filter intended to prevent the Smith's Cove box drains and flood tunnel from being clogged with sand and debris. 
While incrementally picking away at the recently discovered wooden structure with his backhoe, Billy Gerhardt intersects a vein of water. Immediately, the trench begins to flood. The water flow quickly slows to a trickle, allowing the treasure hunters to examine the area from which the water erupted. Curiously, the water appears to have issued from a space between two large boulders which, as Jack Begley remarks, bear great resemblance to those discovered on Smith's Cove back in Season 6, Episode 10, which Doug Crowell suspected might be the remains of one of the box drains. Rick Lagina inserts the end of his shovel into the cavity and finds it to be oriented vertically, and to be deeper than the shaft of his spade. Jack Begley then voices his opinion that the wooden structure might constitute the remains of a searcher shaft called Shaft 5. As the narrator goes on to explain, Shaft 5 was sank by members of the Truro Company in the summer of 1850. The shaft was located about 100 feet from the Smith's Cove beach and was intended to intercept the Smith's Cove flood tunnel. At a depth of about 35 feet, the laborers had encountered a boulder which, when removed, allowed water from below to rise up and flood the shaft. Believing that they had indeed intersected the flood tunnel, the Truro Company men attempted to clog the supposed booby trap with clay and wood pilings. That accomplished, they tried to bail water from the money pit, but to no avail, leading some of the treasure hunters to believe that they had not completely plugged the flood tunnel, and others to suspect that there might be more than one flood tunnel feeding the money pit. For those of you who are here for the summary of the episode, thank you for watching and I hope to see you again next week. The rest of this video will be on the subject of the Knights Baronets of Nova Scotia, a 17th century Scottish chivalric order around which author James McQuiston's theory is based. The story of the Knights Baronets of Nova Scotia begins in the early 1600s, during the infancy of North American colonization. At that time, King James I of England, who was also King James VI of Scotland, hoped to control a huge swath of North American territory stretching from his newly established colony of Virginia to his even younger Newfoundland colony to the north. His designs were thwarted, however, by French explorers Samuel de Champlain and Pierre de Gas sur de Mont, who had recently established a number of North American colonies in Acadia, or the Canadian Maritimes, and along the St. Lawrence River. The oldest of these new French colonies was the settlement of Port Royal, a village situated on the Bay of Fundy on the western coast of what is now Nova Scotia. Although King James had successfully commissioned Samuel Argall, the Admiral of the Virginia Colony, with raising the town to the ground in 1613, the French had simply rebuilt their settlement 8 kilometers or 5 miles up the Annapolis River on the opposite shore. If James were to drive the French away from the colony, he would need to establish a colony of his own in the area. In 1621, William Alexander, one of James's Scottish courtiers, approached the king with an interesting proposal intended to effect this end. Alexander suggested that the king finance a new Scottish colony in the heart of French Acadia by creating a new chivalric order and selling membership to Scottish aristocrats, using the funds raised to purchase outfits for prospective colonists. King James had tried a similar scheme in 1611, in order to populate Ireland with English settlers, with excellent results. The king agreed to the proposal and, on September 10, 1621, he appointed William Alexander the mayor of this vast new colony, which was to be called Nova Scotia or New Scotland. Several years later, on October 18, 1624, he announced his intention to form the Knights Baronets of Nova Scotia, through which he would finance this new colony. King James I never lived to carry out his plan, dying of dysentery on March 27, 1625. His eldest living son and successor, King Charles I, promptly carried on where his father had left off, forming the Knights Baronets of Nova Scotia two months after James's death. Charles ultimately managed to sell 122 baronetcies to Scottish lairds and clan chiefs, which allowed William Alexander's son, also named William Alexander, to establish the colony of Charlesford in the ashes of the old Port Royal. The colony was short-lived. In the 1620s, the English fought against the armies of French King Louis XIII in the Siege of La Rochelle, a conflict between Catholic France and a defending army of French Huguenots or Protestants. The Anglo-French War which revolved around this battle ended in 1629, and in 1632, the defeated Charles I signed a treaty returning all of New France, Charles for it included, to the French. The nearby settlement of Port Royal, known today by its British name Annapolis Royal, would remain in French hands until 1710. Thanks for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video and would like to help support this channel, please check out my book, The Oak Island Encyclopedia, which you can find by clicking the link in the description.